deal or no deal? The president and congressional leaders discuss protections for young immigrants. We have team coverage from the White House and Capitol Hill. Russia war games. Tensions are high in Eastern Europe as Russian troops carry out military drills. What NATO allies are saying. Filtering out pro-lifers. Users of a popular dating app get a choice about Planned Parenthood. And welcoming new bishops. Pope Francis greets baby bishops, as they're called. We'll have a report from Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, September 14th, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The president visits Florida helping Hurricane Irma recovery efforts. Before he left, a debate raged on in the media about last night's White House dinner with top Democrats and whether there was an agreement about the DACA immigration program protecting young people. We have team coverage this evening, including reaction from lawmakers on Capitol Hill with Jason Calvi. But first, we start with correspondent Mark Irons at the White House. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. After conflicting reports from the White House and Democrats, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, President Trump says he's fairly close to a deal with congressional leaders to preserve protections for young, undocumented immigrants living in America. President Trump is visiting Florida post Irma but the future of the dreamers is on his mind. We're not talking about amnesty, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about taking care of people, people that were brought here, people that have done a good job and were not brought here of their own volition. Last week, the president announced the end of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, known as DACA. He wants Congress to decide the fate of nearly 800,000 undocumented immigrants currently living in the U.S. Ever since, negotiations have been in full swing. After a White House dinner last night, Democratic leaders Senator Chuck Schumer and Representative Nancy Pelosi said in a statement, we agreed to enshrine the protections of DACA into law quickly and to work out a package of border security, excluding the wall that's acceptable to both sides. But Trump slammed on the brakes this morning, tweeting, no deal was made last night on DACA. Massive border security would have to be agreed to in exchange for consent, would be subject to vote. The president says that ultimately funding for a border wall with Mexico must be part of any immigration deal. But very importantly, what we want, we have to have a wall. If the wall is going to be obstructed when we need the funds at a little bit later date, we'll be determining how much we need, uh, then we're not doing anything. Right. Pope Francis is urging President Trump to rethink his decision to end DACA. The Holy Father says anyone who calls himself pro-life should keep families together. For its part, the White House says, the Trump administration acted lawfully to correct the unconstitutional actions taken by President Obama. It is now up to Congress to act on behalf of the American people. Catholic bishops continue to express disappointment with the administration's decision to end DACA. This week, the bishops are calling on Catholics to contact their representatives in Congress to urge the passage of legislation that supports DREAMers. The church teaches that we should welcome foreigners, but we also have to uphold the law for the common good. Lauren. Mark, I understand the president took a first-hand tour of Irma's devastation in just a few hours. What did he see? The president toured the hurricane damage in Naples, Florida, and was joined by the first lady and vice president. He shook hands and handed out sandwiches to victims of the storm. It was also a chance for him to see how FEMA is responding. Tonight, many Florida residents still don't have electricity. In fact, 2.7 million homes and businesses are still without power. Correspondent Mark Irons reporting from the White House. Thank you, Mark. Some conservative immigration hardliners, both in and out of the government, slam President Trump for this possible immigration agreement. But many defend the president. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi just talked to lawmakers. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. No matter what did or didn't happen at the White House last night, it's right here, Congress is the one that will have to debate and then vote on any immigration plan. Now, many lawmakers I've been speaking with say they'd be willing to support a deal, but the question, what deal? 
the number two Senate Republican John Cornyn tells me there's no deal on immigration yet. Senator Schumer uh, is anxious to sort of declare victory, but I think to me it looks like a deal to make a deal. On the other side of the Capitol, we hear the same story. House Speaker Paul Ryan says the president told him... It was a discussion, not an agreement or negotiation. Even suggesting a deal worries some of Trump's conservative supporters. Immigration hardliner Steve King of Iowa says if the deal fails to include a border wall, then the Trump base is blown up, destroyed, irreparable, and disillusioned beyond repair. No promise is credible. But Senator Tom Tillis assures Republicans that the bill will be conservative, strengthening border security. He says the president's dinner last night is part of needed change here in Washington. I like the way he's doing it. He's getting the heat. So he's got to keep the face up. You know, what happens around here is what typically happens. Everybody talks about it for a while and they never produce a result. We've got to produce a result. I think the president's doing a good job. Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania tells me there's still time to reach a compromise, and he's working on a proposal. We have a president and a Congress that's willing to work on an opportunity for all sides to be successful and win here. Conservative House Freedom Caucus leader Mark Meadows says before Paul Ryan became speaker, he committed to them not to bring up any immigration bill unless a majority of House Republicans backed it. That's considered the Hassert rule. It's not a real rule, but Republican speakers have often followed that since the 90s. Lauren? What about the average American, Jason? Where do they stand on dreamers and all of the children who are here illegally and brought here by their parents? A recent YouGov poll finds about half of the country supports giving the DACA dreamers a, uh, some sort of protection, but 30% of the country says these illegal immigrants brought over illegally when they were children by their parents should be deported. Correspondent Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. Pro-life leaders visit the White House today. They're pushing the life issue for the midterm elections. We'll be bringing this into the 2018 elections in Senate battleground states. It'll be a very high profile issue. Uh, incumbent senators want to be on the right side of that. Susan B. Anthony list president Marjorie Dannenfelser was joined by business and entrepreneur leaders. The group discussed how to build a successful project to save lives. And the Trump administration may be looking to decrease the number of refugees admitted to the U.S. next year. Officials tell the New York Times that a White House senior advisor, Stephen Miller, is leading the charge to reduce refugees to fewer than 50,000, citing limits with money and resources. And the White House is tapping James E. Trainer, a lawyer from Texas and a Catholic, to be commissioner of the Federal Election Commission. The announcement comes after Senator Dianne Feinstein questioned the faith of another Catholic, Amy Barrett, a judicial nominee. Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, one member, who is a Mormon, expressed his concern to me. Joining us now is Republican Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. What went through your mind when you heard Amy Barrett's faith being grilled by the Democratic senators? Look, as a religious minority myself, uh, my ears tend to peak up a little bit when somebody starts inquiring into a nominee's religious views. There's a reason why Article 6 of the Constitution expressly prohibits religious tests. Our founding fathers rightly concluded that no one should be disqualified uh, from a position based on their religious beliefs or, or the absence thereof. Uh, this is a, a non-issue. It shouldn't come up, and I don't see any good reason to bring it up in a judicial hearing. You feel as a member of Congress that religion is being used more and more as a litmus test? Uh, look, uh, the fact remains that in addition to this uh, incident last week, uh, there was another incident a few months ago in which one of my colleagues inquired into a, a nominee's religious views, asked uh, uh, a, a nominee who was an evangelical Christian uh, whether he believed that someone had to be a Christian in order to gain salvation. The nominee responded by pointing out that he holds the views uh, espoused by evangelical Christians. And this colleague later refused to support that nominee. Uh, so this is troubling. I, look, I, I can't attribute intent or uh, uh, motives to any single statement made by any single colleague. 
Uh, what I am saying is that it makes me very nervous anytime someone starts to inquire into one's religious views or starts to say that uh, the, the dogma runs too deep, uh, uh, is too prominent in a nominee's life. That, that sounds a little bit too personal and sounds a little bit like a religious test to me. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Jason Calvey, broke this story. He has asked Senator Feinstein, who made, said that, for comment. And you have spoken to her about this issue or, or not? Uh, look, every time one of these issues come, comes up, it's my job to, to make clear uh, that the Constitution prohibits a religious test. I don't feel the need to reach out to one of my colleagues every single time it, it happens. Uh, but I do feel the need to remind my colleagues that, in general, uh, we cannot have religious tests. We can't have them ever. And we should avoid this kind of thing. Thank you so much for joining us. Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Thank you. Tensions are high in the Baltic states as thousands of Russian troops carry out military drills. NATO allies like Lithuania, living just miles away, worry Russia is preparing for war with the West. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the Pentagon. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Military officials in Belarus, the Russian ally hosting the drills, are looking to calm Western fears, saying they're not looking to threaten anyone. But some members of NATO are blasting Moscow's lack of transparency and questioning Russia's real intentions. Joint military drills are now underway at an undisclosed location in Belarus. Video from Russian state television showing tanks and jets practicing. It's a series of war games the Russians have codenamed Zapad, or West. Prior to today's drills, the prime minister of Russia's neighbor, Estonia, voiced his concern. Along with other allies, we allow the exercise very closely and remain ready for every situation. Estonia is one of three Baltic states, alongside Latvia and Lithuania. All are worried about potential Russian aggression. The three countries are NATO allies, while their neighbor Belarus is allied with Russia. Their war games are always offensive. Congressman Chris Smith, a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, says today's drills are troubling. What's the end game here? Uh, is it to retake uh, the Baltics? Uh, is it, you know, so these are real questions. Again, reconstituting the Soviet Union in whole or in part remains a very, very strong concern of mine. Adding to the tension, a thousand American Army vehicles are now in Poland. But NATO allies say the move is not a response to Russia's drills, it's just protocol. NATO, which is now a 29-member military alliance, has boosted its own military presence in Eastern Europe. Last month, the U.S. sent additional F-15 fighter jets to patrol the Baltic Sea area. Lauren? Wyatt, tensions between the U.S. and Russia have been high for the last three years. Remind us what triggered it. Well, Lauren, it started when the Russians invaded and annexed a region called Crimea in March of 2014. The West considers Crimea to be part of Ukraine. So since then, the U.S. and its allies have imposed various sanctions on Russia. And many say relations between the U.S. and Russia haven't been this bad since the Cold War. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby at the Pentagon. Thank you, Wyatt. And Wyatt is heading to New York City next week for the U.N. General Assembly. And you can watch his reports on Monday and Tuesday here on News Nightly. At least 60 people are dead, nearly 100 more wounded after a car bomb strikes a checkpoint in southern Iraq. The attack started with militants opening fire at the checkpoint and a restaurant on the main highway linking Baghdad with the southern provinces. That was followed by two suicide bomber blasts, including one driving a car. No one has claimed responsibility. A boat crowded with construction workers capsizes in northern India, killing at least 19 people. The search is underway for missing passengers. Accidents are common in India, as many ferries are poorly built and often overcrowded. Safety regulations are often lacking. A fire blocks the only exit in a dorm at an Islamic school in Malaysia, causing nearly 23 deaths, mostly teens. A government official says a wall separated the victims from a second exit, and it should not have been there. Firefighters rushed to the scene after receiving a distress call. It took about an hour to put out the fire, and fire department officials believe an electrical short circuit caused that fire. 
Coming up, the Pope meets with new bishops. New Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley on what he told them. And the mystery continues. New information about American diplomats in Cuba and their health problems. Everyone's just been so excited. It's official, Los Angeles will host the 2028 Olympics. The International Olympic Committee made the announcement yesterday. Paris will get the games in 2024 after three failed attempts. A U.S. diplomatic mystery deepens. At least 21 people in Cuba experienced hearing loss and speech problems after sound blasts in Havana. Now, the FBI, State Department, and other agencies are getting involved. U.S. investigators still have not determined what caused these attacks or what type of device was responsible, but they're testing several theories about sonic weapons and other devices. The United States first acknowledged the attacks in August, nine months after symptoms were first reported. The Associated Press has found that some of the incidents were confined to certain rooms at a Havana hotel. Cuba's government has declined to answer specific questions about those incidents. Mass is being celebrated again at Coptic churches in northern Egypt. They were forced to close last month due to security concern. The World Watch Monitor says leaders of the churches thank the government for their help and their promise to open other closed churches. And Pope Francis meets with newly appointed bishops from all over the world, including one from the United States like Bishop Jorge Humberto Rodriguez Novello, an auxiliary in the Archdiocese of Denver. The Pope, when I saw him enter into the room, immediately he makes you feel at ease. No? So he joked, he said, wow, it looks like we have here Vatican III, not because we were many bishops there. So everybody laughed, and that really uh, made the rest of the meeting very easy. The Mexican-born bishop was appointed by Pope Francis in August 2016. Juliet Lindley is EWTN News Nightly's Vatican correspondent. She joins us from Rome. Juliet, you spoke to the bishop. What did the Holy Father tell him and others? The Holy Father was very keen to emphasize that things are not black and white. He really made a point of saying that discernment is so important and cultivating an attitude of listening. As you know, in life, there are so many gray areas. And so he really wanted to get across to these new bishops that there is no formula that you can just repeat. You really need to look at every case individually. Tell us more about the makeup of the group of bishops. Now, just for a sense of context, there are 5,000, more or less, slightly more than that, around the world, 5,000 bishops. And this year, about 125 newly appointed ones. The ones who are here were from North and South America, Australia, the Philippines, and Europe. And they were here for what is affectionately called the Baby Bishop School. <laughs> and it's the annual training program for, for freshly appointed bishops. Uh, the Baby Bishops, that's very cute. The Holy Father now, switching topics a little bit, is back to his regular schedule. He had taken some time off this summer, and this includes morning mass in the Vatican with employees. Tell us what he said today. Indeed, the Holy Father, his summer ended actually before now, but he was away last week in Colombia, as we know, on his apostolic trip. So this morning at 7 a.m., he held his daily mass at the chapel at Santa Marta, where he lives. And um, he chose this mass, which was the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, to focus on two spiritual, to warn about two spiritual temptations when it comes to considering Christ on the cross. Firstly, Christ without the cross, which would essentially mean he would be the spiritual master. And then the cross without Christ, which would be a case of spiritual masochism. Now, he also focused on people's fear of the future. And all of us don't know what tomorrow holds for us. And he, again, it's not the first time that he talked about not turning to soothsayers or to horoscopes or palm readers to try and find out, find out what awaits us. Uh, he, he said you need to trust in the Holy Spirit and you need to trust in the Lord who will guide you upon a path and be open to the surprises that the Lord has in store for us. How wonderful would it be to be an employee at the Vatican who gets to hear Mass from the Pope every day? Thank you so much, Juliet Lindley. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. EWTN News Nightly Vatican Correspondent. Up next, a dating app partners with Planned Parenthood, how they're targeting pro-life users. 
And a Texas abortion provider is zeroing in on victims of Hurricane Harvey. We'll tell you how. As Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley just mentioned, today is the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. Today celebrates the discovery of the true cross in Jerusalem by St. Helena in 320, as well as the commemoration of God's death on the cross taken from today's Mass. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we are saved and delivered. The popular dating app OkCupid okay announces a partnership with the largest abortion provider in the U.S. The app asks users, should the government defund Planned Parenthood? Those saying no receive a badge on their profile. I stand with Planned Parenthood. And on Twitter, the app posted this image saying, I would never date someone who doesn't support Planned Parenthood. Okay, Cupid makes it easy to find them. 80% of respondents have said no so far. Also on social media, the women's whole health abortion chain in Texas is recruiting by offering free abortions to those affected by Hurricane Harvey for the entire month of September. Other groups, the Lilith Fund and Women's March, are asking for donations. Abby Johnson joins us via Skype from Austin, Texas. She is the founder of And Then There Were None, which helps abortion workers leave their jobs just the way she did. She's also the author of Unplanned, the dramatic true story of a former Planned Parenthood leader's eye-opening journey across the lifeline. Welcome to the program, Abby. Oh, thank you for having me. In 2000, when Louisiana was just devastated by Hurricane Katrina, nearly 2,000 people lost their lives. At the same time, you worked in Houston for Planned Parenthood, and they offered the same free abortion services for the about quarter of a million people who fled New Orleans. Now, what is the thinking behind this? Help us get into the mind of abortion providers. Well, I think the, the thought was, uh, you know, there may be people here who uh, have found themselves pregnant in the past few weeks or maybe who had abortion appointments scheduled in Louisiana, and now they find themselves without a provider and without a place to go. And so, you know, instead of actually trying to find ways to help them uh, with their pregnancy or volunteering in shelters or volunteering in food banks, we said we will provide free abortion services for them. And I say free, um, but really that should be in quotes because nothing the abortion industry does is ever free. Uh, we were reimbursed by the Lilith Fund at that time. Now, uh, today, they have reimbursement from the Warren Buffett Foundation. So nothing that they do is, right. is free. Tell me why you had a change of heart. Well, a couple things. One, I was told to double our abortion quota, so the amount of abortions that we had to sell to women every month, and that was troublesome for me. Uh, I really got involved with Planned Parenthood thinking that we were trying to reduce the abortion rate, so uh, doubling our abortion quota didn't make sense to me. But ultimately, I left after witnessing a live ultrasound-guided wow. abortion procedure where I saw a 13-week-old baby fight and struggle for his life, ultimately to to lose his life to the hand of the abortionist. So now your group is helping workers just like you leave these clinics. I want to show our viewers part of your campaign. It involves billboards like this one. It says no one grows up wanting to work in an abortion clinic. And that has then abortionworker.com, which is your website. Have you been successful in your effort? We have. Uh, we found it and then there were none in 2012. And so far, we've had 380 abortion clinic workers leave their jobs and come through our ministry. And uh, we've also had seven full-time abortion doctors leave their jobs and are now working to defend life. And your story is just incredible. Thank you so much for joining us. Abby Johnson, founder, and then there were none. Tonight on EWTN's Pro-Life Weekly, host Katherine Zeltner talks to a Catholic doctor who wants to bring back house calls. She says the future of life-affirming medicine is improving the doctor-patient relationship. Family is the foundation of our society. And if your family is not well, physically, emotionally, spiritually, how can we be functioning members of our society and give back? 
You can see more of this interview tonight at a special time, 10.30 Eastern on EWTN. Pro-Life Weekly re-airs Sunday morning at 10 a.m. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless you.